Hi, everybody. Um, so, I'm so glad that you're here. We have some more folks coming. We had some people who are coming from another event. So we'll welcome them when they get here. So glad you're here. Uh, so Steve Metcalf, who is sitting way over there, and I came up with, did we come up with it? It just started to happen. It's pretty organic. Yeah, a couple times a year, like mold. Steve yeah. has a great idea and thinks, let's bring so-and-so and have a conversation. Now, I should be just holding the mic and saying, welcome to the writer's house and off with the show, you know, or on with the show, anyway. <laughs> off Not with off. And there's a reception and all that stuff. But it kind of, the way it's worked out is I sit here at the end, kind of at an angle, so that two friends can have a conversation. And Steve kind of likes the fact that every once in a while I will cause some shape to happen and maybe move things along, whatever. I, I have a purpose to serve, but mostly right now, just to say hello to you. And I'm gonna introduce Steve and mention June, and Steve's gonna introduce June improvisationally. <laughs> He's looking at like me like. everything that you do. And then we're gonna have a conversation <laughs> that's, well, it's about podcasting, and these two people to my right know an awful lot about podcasting. Um, but it'll be, let's say, podcasting plus. So there'll be all kinds of things happening, right, June? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. So uh, Steve Metcalf uh, uh, is uh, Slate's. Uh, are you like a writer at large? What are you called? I'm not, I'm nothing. I mean, I'm just the the host of the Culture Podcast. <laughs> and for Slate. the host. How many of you have ever heard Slate's Culture Gab Fest, which is a weekly thing? Everybody in this room. Oh, oh that's, that's cool, Mary. What do you think? It's him. This is the guy. <laughs> I'm so, thank you. I thank you, Mary. That. Thank you. Um, and uh, he's a, uh, just a brilliant uh, writer and teacher. And he has taught here, actually, some years back. And uh, I think the way we met is I listened to the Gap Fest and I had some criticisms. So I got in touch. No, maybe not. But I got in <laughs> touch with you and... And we got together, and we you've been coming to the writer's house ever since, which is great. And, and June Thomas, I said to you earlier that I'm a fanboy of everything that you have done. Um, and uh, as you'll find out, June is in charge of all of the whole suite of Slate podcasts, which is quite a lot. And we know, we know, people in this audience know that podcasting, is we're all a little obsessed with it. Uh, here and we're really eager to hear what the two of you have to say about it and so we'll do that for uh, a, a while we'll probably the whole the whole session will end maybe about at about seven or five after seven and then we have a really yummy reception with also some some wine things to drink and you'll have a chance to chat informally with these two but we'll also have I believe we have a portable mic so at a certain point we'll be able to take your questions and comments, and that'll be fun. And the reason for a portable mic, even though we have an intimate space with really good acoustics, is that we want to be able to record the session. So, Steve, mm -hmm. how are you? Uh, very good. It's really great to see you again. It is great to see you. So do you want to set this thing up and get started? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I will. What do you want to do? I mean, I don't have a prepared introduction, but I, I, you know, June, I think that there are so many different possible ways into this. Um, but um, maybe if you could be begin by describing, I mean, I, I, I associate you with the, for lack of a better word, amphibiousness that's overtaken the digital and the journalistic world over the last 10 or 15 years or so, whereby a person can be a writer, maybe in their essence, or an editor, or basically a cr creature of the print world mm -hmm. learning to survive in other environments, atmospheres, ecosystems, out of necessity on the one hand, and um, a kind of self-reinventiveness or, or exploration of new and other modes and in search of bigger or different or my, more diverse, really, audiences, um, discovering other media in which to express oneself. Um, and also, so I think of you, I should say, as a writer, an editor, who then discovered, along with me, parallel to me, and in, you know, in tandem with me and others, um, uh, podcasting, 
an audio, um, which I have to imagine must have been so, somewhat unexpected. <laughs> I, you probably never thought of yourself or conceived of yourself as a broadcaster. So all of this is, all of this verbiage really just points to a question, which is um, throw out maybe some self descriptions and um, some autobiography. Um, um, what do you do, and how did you end up doing it? All right. Well, actually, I would. It's not exactly a correction, but just to yeah. fill fill in a little bit that. Um, before I worked at Slate, um, I had, I actually, before I worked at Slate, I worked in publishing at Seal Press, a feminist press. And before that I worked at, um, mostly small feminist publications like Off Our Backs and in Britain outright. And I also had worked on, uh, what was on a couple of like, women's feminist radio shows. Um, the first on a college campus at the University of Delaware, which obviously is a big uh, companion to the University of Pennsylvania, I'm sure. Um, lots in common. And um, also in DC on a Pacifica station called WPFW. And so that was something that I did, you know, that was like my youth, that was like my, mm -hmm. the thing that was my adventurous pre-professional, this is the thing that I really like to do, but I don't imagine this will be um, my work. And then when I got to Slate and actually started to do podcasts because Slate for a while had a radio show that we did in collaboration with NPR. So it was an NPR show, but Slate um, was a formal partner and we tried to have Slate people on every day. And when Andy Bowers, the the, the NPR veteran who Slate hired to be like our person to translate Slate to the radio, when he would go on vacation, because I was based in Seattle, I would go and cover for him. And one day he came back from his vacation early and so we actually coincided and he just showed me like how you edit audio. Like he literally just showed me the editor. He mm -hmm. didn't do it, and, but I thought, oh, yeah, I think I, that seems really interesting. It just kind of reminded me of my time, you know, actually using uh, razor blades and sticky tape. And, and you know, it was, now we were in the digital era and, and I'd kind of missed that transition. But um, it was an opportunity uh, to not have to choose anymore. You mm -hmm. didn't have to choose between print or writing or editing. You could do writing and or editing and you could be a radio person. You could make what we then thought of as radio, now we see that it actually is, um, has possibilities that are very difficult to take advantage of in radio, but that you could be an audio journalist as well as a print journalist. Um, so that is my short background, but then I also know, I, you know, honestly my role is quite um, uh, administrative, like I, just make sure that shows have producers and people get paid. Like it, it, I don't want to exaggerate the, uh, you know, the creative, the creativity. Your status is the Harvey Weinstein yeah. of Slate. No, no, definitely the not. mogul. No. We all cower when June no, walks I'm, in the room. I'm more the middle manager slash accountant. Well, let's we'll get there later. <laughs> <laughs> right. There are many intriguing mm. uh, byways we mm. have to traverse first. Mm. So this person that you meet, Andy Bowers has a super simple insight, yeah. which is that audio on demand, that the digital distribution capacities of the internet mean that audio on demand is an inevitability. And a remarkable part of that story is, of course, from the vantage point of 2019, Andy Bowers was totally right. And, and you would think any fool would have seen it as long as 20 years ago. But between Andy Bowers saying it, thinking it, saying it, promoting it to the brass at Slate, mm -hmm. forging for himself an entirely new job and job title there, which was Pubav Podcasting or whatever it was, um, and uh, and starting up several podcasts and the actual fruition in, in, a, in, a, in a viable business model turned out to be actually quite a, there was a long period there where people said of Slate and Andy Bowers, oh, this is nonsense. This is silly. This is not going to, there's no revenue model here. This is just, uh, why would you throw, you know, and a lot of people tried podcasts mm -hmm. and failed at podcasts, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why that kind of rhetoric really, um, you started to hear quite quite frequently. So 
why do you think that it took as long as it did? Why did Slate stick with it? And why did how did Slate make it work when others were struggling with it? I think Slate stuck with it because it's an opinion magazine, which is, as we know, somewhat unusual in the U.S. In Britain, you know, there's a, things are a bit more porous of people expressing opinions and being reporters. But um, I think, you know, that's why the show that we did with NPR kind of didn't work because NPR wasn't really comfortable with mm-hmm. opinion. Right. And, and that was day-to-day? Was that yeah, day-to-day. Um, and it, it just... It, it's their culture. I mean, it's it's not a crazy thing that they were uncomfortable. Like that's 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 how they're set up. But we were set up to be stating opinions, and so the people who were on staff, even though they may never have you know sat in front of a microphone, they were really good at expressing opinions, and they enjoyed it, <laughs> and they enjoyed it, and they loved. I mean, one of, as you know very well, one of Andy's key insights was you got to argue with each other. Damn. You got to take issue. Right. And they loved arguing, got a shock, you know? And so th- I think people really, really liked doing it. And that's why people at Slate didn't give up on it is because they didn't want to. Right, right. So I think you're, you're, you're moving us toward a very interesting distinction, which is on the one hand, yes, you could take pre-existing NPR shows, you could package them as podcasts, and the difference was simply the mode of delivery and the on-demand, you know... What's that? Ossity, the on-demand ossity of it. Ossity, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly, the on-demand ossity of it. Um, the sheer convenience of being able to choose what you listen to and what, like, ha- not hostage to turning on the radio and you're in your car and you're just trapped with whatever NPR or otherwise show you might find. But there's another aspect, which is, in fact, that's not really what podcasting is. And when you say podcasting, it doesn't connote just listening to This American Life at your convenience. It means something else, a variety of other yeah. things, but yeah. talk about maybe what some of those are. I mean, you've started already yeah. opinionated and slightly shameless uh, blabbermouth journalists right. around the microphone. I mean, it's also right. cheap, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, no, yeah. I mean, and, and I think that was that was the the original slate mode, you know, the political gabfest, the culture gabfest, audio boot club, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and then the sports chat show, hang up and listen. Um, spoiler specials, which we, which are, I see Sam Adams, who often is on Slate Spoiler mm-hmm. Specials, um, which is when it was another Andy Bowers insight that if you have, if you can listen to this audio on demand, well, one of those on demand times might be after you've just seen a movie, mm-hmm. and that's when you're leaving the cinema and you're like, what was that at the end? That, that made no sense. To be actually, maybe you can't be in that conversation, but you can hear other people having that conversation about that twist was crazy, right? No, it wasn't crazy. It was completely justified by that thing that, and so that was another key insight. And so those, that they were smart people having interesting conversations, but they were also casual Mm -hmm. because obviously there've been chat shows forever. Um, But the idea, again, uh, just to give Andy his 99th uh, uh, mention, it was the idea, you know, we're all f- familiar, maybe, with the Sunday morning TV chat shows where journalists get together and they talk about what's happened in the news. But Andy's key insight was, well, what about after they've left mm, the studio mm-hmm. and they, you know, the cameras are off, maybe they've had a drink. That's not totally necessary, but they're just like they're being themselves. They're not putting on their, okay, I'm on television, I'm all uptight, and I'm going to give you my three points. It's like what they really think. Mm-hmm. You know, I was visiting with a friend of mine in California. We were out doing a live show and uh, saw this old friend, and he had this insight that I had never thought of. And it's so, it's so simple, and it seems so true to me, which is that he is now such a – and he backed into it because he's such a veteran listener of uh, podcasts now that he tried returning to NPR for maybe coverage of the hearings or mm-hmm. something. And he said that format, once you get used to this other format, that format seems hopelessly antique. It's like watch, you know, man wearing a Hamburg or something. It just seems like from another century. And he said that that format, the nature of it is this 
it's one journalist interviewing another journalist. The first journalist pretends to know absolutely nothing and asks these faux naive questions of like, well, why? I mean, Michael Barbaro sort of has brought it into the age of podcasting, mm-hmm. arguably sort of successfully. But 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 when you return to NPR or television news, it's like, well, why exactly would the Democrats want to oppose the Republicans? And then, you know, and then this person comes out with three canned, relatively canned talking points, and it resembles nothing like human speech or human dialogue dialogue and um you know I, I the story i always heard about the genesis of the political gap fest was that they they got together to do a call or they it was it, they used to do a call that pre- prepared prepared them to do the gap fest and andy was like no 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 no. the call is the gap fest the, right. th- the three of you shitting around saying what you really think and in a completely like peer peer-to-peer um, style of self presentation. That's what the show should be, and that from that insight came an empire. Yes, and actually, that's a really interesting. Um, I don't know. If the, I don't believe this is just slate, but it's very much a slate kind of mood that you prepare. You know, one of the things that I think is people think that you just go into the studio and you just ta- start talking. Uh, actually. You have to do a lot of reading. You have to do a lot of thinking. You have to know what you're talking about. You have to think it through. But you never start the conversation before the mic. Um, you know, you mm-hmm. have your conversation mm-hmm. inside your own head, but you never start sharing your thoughts with the other hosts until the microphones are turned on because you don't. Again, that would sound like it would sound scripted. It would sound yeah. um, like you're saying something you've already said six times, which certainly happens on some podcasts. I mean, there are certainly podcasts where you know they have had that exchange about 25, maybe 50, maybe 100 times, and they just pick one. Yeah. But that is not the kind of podcast, um, until recently anyway, that Slate has made. Right. And we'll get to other kinds of podcasts. You guys uh, had a huge huge success with slow burn which is of course on a different model of podcasting and we'll get there in a second but sticking for a little bit with the sort of gab fest or chat or whatever mm-hmm. format um uh i am always struck by what you know we were three people with a microphone right when we started the culture gab fest it was totally rinky dink it was a, a three people microphone a closet and maybe someone was twiddling some kind of a dial and we giggled and laughed at our the, our pretension the fact that we were like and it we sort of felt as though it was nonsense why would anyone listen to this and over time you begin to the medium begins to develop and it's odd to be it's odd to be part of a medium that doesn't really exist mm-hmm. right and you are discovering what it is by making it yourself to some degree and and part of that is well who's listening how are they listening and you know and why and you know what what are they likely to respond to and not respond to and over time it just became evident that on our end it was a performed conversation and the sweet spot was actually kind of small right between over and under preparation between just bullshitting and the seat of your pants but also between between Talking points. And, right, and, and being pretending to be uh, in disagreement and actually fighting. Right, all of that, right. And then on the other end, it just was this very simple realization that people are listening with earbuds. Yeah, you're Like in once you really understood you're in someone's, you're actually physically sort of inside their yeah. head, uh, you know, the chamber of their own mentality in a way that other forms of audio really aren't. It's yeah. different. And they tend to be doing, they tend to, we, all the time it's like, oh, you guys, I, it's ritual, it's highly ritualistic. I do this when I do X, mm-hmm. right? Like I do this when I mow my lawn and when I uh, bale the hay, which I actually do with someone. I do that. Uh, we have an anthropologist in the Amazon who's lived there in the jungle in Manaus. And, you know, I, I am situated here. I am doing this and you are my friends companions Mm -hmm. you know it's it's intimate in a way that's slightly creepy yeah (laughs) i wanted i wanted you to say it thank you yes um yeah i mean that i i agree completely and i also there is something about the fact that you're offering people an an alternative way of experiencing well in our case your magazine um um, just to explain mm. what I mean, when I first started to do podcasts, which I believe was 2005, th- what I did was read a Slate story into a microphone, I edited it down, yeah. I uploaded it. Like, it was, now you think, why would we be doing that? It was banal. But 
I then went once to an event and all these people came up to me. I hadn't even written the piece. I was just recording somebody else's piece and uploading it. It was my voice, which obviously is amazing, but that was all that I could really, you know, claim to. Um, and I was like, well, why, you know, what is so great about this? And they, what people said was, look, I don't have time to read the magazine. I don't have, you know, whatever. But what they did have was this, this moment in their lives, which might be like when they're at the gym or when they're walking their dog or, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. But it's an opportunity that they like, I can squeeze this in and I, I can get pleasure or information or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a combination of, which I guess basically amounts to convenience, but just just feeling that this is something they can do, that there's this sense of possibility um, which kind of elevates it from just convenience or intimacy to something that you can choose. You, mm -hmm. can, you know, that you, as you say, you're not just turning on the radio and what's on. Like, my God, I'm looking in, there's so many things I could choose. And I might make some bad choices, but I, I'm, I'm in charge of this. Mm -hmm. And the, the fact that companionability is such a big part of it, right? So there's also this other process of discovery whereby... Well, first of all, if you're not a professional broadcaster, the alienating truth that your voice is being multiplied out in heads, you know, dog walking heads, right. ear butted dog walking heads out in the world. And people have very deep feelings about who you are, your opinions. I mean, try try publicly disliking something that <laughs> someone loves or cherishes in the culture, the vitriol and the your reaction is so intense, but but that's never happened to you. Never, no, I don't know. <laughs> June, people are all over oh, June, but it's it, the um the it's it's this the the question of first of all the 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 shock at how much of yourself you are revealing in just the timbre of your voice and your choice of words and your opinions. The um the attempt to control what you are and aren't revealing about who you are personally and biographically and what about you comes out in interacting with this same set of people on a weekly basis year after year after year and then how that enters into the psychodrama of your listeners it was just all brand new not only because we had never been broadcasters but because podcasting and this this degree of intimacy and companionability was really a new thing yeah and uh you can grab the microphone from me if you like steve but like there are some writers who when they do squeeze those words out those words are magnificent but might find it easier to express themselves by every week going into a room mm -hmm. and sitting in front of a mic and just talking and that you know the whatever challenges they might have of um you know filing their copy or you know blah 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 like this is something that they have an amazing skill and gift and facility for and uh that's pretty cool mm -hmm. so june i'm not gonna let you off the hook here mm -hmm. because you've come on our podcast Many since times. the beginning mm -hmm. um people People, the number of times people say, you know, June Thomas, <laughs> people love, they attach to you. There's something about your voice. You know, it's the, it's the, you know, accent insecurity of Americans, you know, their love of the English accent. Mm -hmm. um, but also you do actually talk about your journey, for lack <laughs> of a better word, to this country from a very specific perspective place and background is that something you'd be comfortable talking a little bit about because well, it's it's formed a it's formed a not small part of um what we've experienced of you on our uh, in our format i mean i am i am very sherry so there there is that but um uh it's funny because i um i know recently uh i can't oh i think i guess two cultural phenomena caused me to share things about my, you know, my background, whatever, my, my journey. Um, so the first one, the HBO and BBC show Gentleman Jack, which had a great, uh, is, is about lesbians, which obviously is something I can relate to, but also um, has a big um, story about coal and, uh, uh, and coal mines and so I, I grew up in a coal mining village. My dad, my grandparents were miners. 
Um, and then recently in the show The Crown, there was also a scene of a, um, a, a mining disaster in which uh, children were killed or an entire community was, was affected. And I talked about that on a podcast too, which was like, in fact, a very hugely disturbing thing in my childhood, even though that thing didn't happen in my town. But like we had the same fear because we also had a big heap on just opposite our house. Um, and so I think when you, if you are willing to make personal connections, you don't always have to, you can actually share things that people don't necessarily always hear or you know, they might still not be interested or they might still think, oh, God, too much sharing. Mm. Um, but uh, I do think that, I know, I want, I don't necessarily always, I don't want to be a poster child or anything like that. But, you know, I think if people, um, I, I do want to be the most famous lesbian coal mining town, working class <laughs> immigrant uh, <laughs> podcaster, sure. Well, you've bested <laughs> me in that category, so... <laughs> Um, <laughs> talk a little bit about what it was like to really pioneer in um, both print and audio a certain gender queer diversity that might not have been familiar to people limited to print traditional print uh, NPR the usual media diet slate was able to do something because of you and you were able to do something because of Slate. Talk a little bit about what you created in that regard. Well, um, not on my own, of course. Also, definitely Brian Lauder, very involved. But um, when we started Outward, you know, it wasn't like on the cusp of um, people being aware of, you know, LGBTQ issues. But it there really weren't, there wasn't a section that came from a place where um, you didn't have to kind of like for the longest time like if you mentioned uh gay lesbian trans people you would have to buy people you would have to kind of explain what that meant yeah. you would have to do the you know explanatory comma and we didn't want to do that and we also were not ever about to you know make a case for the humanity of queer or trans or you know any people and so there was like this assumption of uh, that was surprisingly, um, you know, again, even not that many years later, it just seems ridiculous. But it it was actually uh, something that was difficult to do. And you know, also any time, like I remember doing a piece many years before we launched out with it, Slate, but doing a piece about the show um, Queer as Folk. Uh, the the American version and like doing a um, a video, you know, we used to do video slideshows back then. Oh. <sighs> um, and uh, like the editor, who was a nice guy, like my editor, wanting to put a like a warning, and there was nothing in it. It was there was no sex. There was maybe there was kissing, but there was nothing. Um, we certainly would not have put a warning for straight people doing those things, and so. To you know, but we still did the piece. Um, and actually, I don't think we maybe we did have a warning. Um, so I don't know. It's very hard actually to kind of put myself that far back to think what we did. Mm. Um, but I think too, like one of the things I think if there's a criticism that people make of Slate now as opposed to Slate, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I've actually been at the magazine for twenty two years, as astonishingly. Um, it was that now we're not as surprising. You know, like you you know what you're going to get. You know what kind of general political positions are going to be expressed um and i think there was a little bit of you know pushback about that like we shouldn't be so predictable and i think one thing that people didn't understand was that within the gay media we were like we were not saying the same things as other people we were being very unpredictable i think to straight people in the magazine or maybe straight people in the media what we were doing was like, oh, of course they're going to, we know what they're going to say, but actually what we were saying was not what anybody, not all the time, but we were definitely not towing the, you know, the gay media line. Mm. Can I ask you both about the number three? Uh, the discussion GabFest format is three. That works really well. When I wanted to do one with four, I was told too many voices, they won't be able to distinguish them, and my podcast is four. But... Three presents a problem with diversity 
uh, and it has been a big problem. Actually. Oh, sure. Yeah. So can either of you talk about, I mean, three is a limitation because if you had four or five, it's easier to get the point of view you need for the special topic that you have. We, uh, we actually have four on my podcast on okay, The Waves right go. now. Um, which was the waves, yeah. Yep. But the waves, but the, honestly, that was kind of because not by design, really. It was because one, I was. We had two teams of three, and two of the women on my team uh, decided they needed to stop doing the show, and I didn't want to stop doing it, so we made one team of four. Um, and it is probably too many voices, to be honest with you. Like it, you know, if everybody wants to get their their licks in. You know, you've kind of taken up a lot of time. It's it's a uh, it makes for an editing challenge, um, but yeah, I mean the diversity thing is I don't know that it's particularly a problem with three because I do think there's some even though I hate the number three, I really dislike it. But it is um, it is there are many logistical and and just kind of time based reasons why it's good. But I mean the, it's not really about the number three. It's about like the fact that so many of our original podcast like when we slate when Slate started doing podcasts, it was really a white magazine mm -hmm. and, and our right. you know, our staff was white, our writers were white and the podcasters were white and yeah. it's just kind of the original sin. And so, you've got and S Steve's group, it's the three of them, they've been around a long time. You don't want to break up the gang, right, but right. you do try to break Steve, you want to talk about the struggles with that? Yeah, I, I it's such a well, first of all, just I do think four voices is so qualitatively different than three. Just in terms of setting aside the question of diversity, which I want to get to. Uh, as a format, I think you you know the stool kind of needs three legs, and then on a provisional ba basis, you bring in a fourth, whether that's a creator, you know, a show creator or a musician, or someone who has a sp specific expertise that the panel otherwise lacks, um, and then you have four voices, a provisional pr provisional fourth, sometimes to strengthen and balance the the stool, as it were, in this terrible metaphor, but um, um, I think that that really works. I think if you have four and you're bringing in a fifth, uh, people do get lost. Uh, audio can be a little hard to follow in that regard. Diversity, I think diversity is a really complex, but it's a very evolving question as well. So I think it's probably is, there is a degree of salutary embarrassment we should have about being white, middle-aged, cis, hetero uh, hosts. Uh, and if you were to start the show today, I don't think you would do that, right? But we'll definitely not do that. Yeah, no, exactly. You wouldn't, and it's a, kind of a legacy of another time. And but what I would say, and I was conscious of this fairly early on, was um, in podcasting, you have no monopoly over the uh, mode of distribution, which is potentially infinite, and you knew from the beginning that producers were going to come in of content were going to come in and diversity would be achieved on the receiving end by the consumer because the consumer was no longer hostage to three tv networks one public broadcaster a major newspaper all of whom had to be as semi-monopolists or oligopolists all of whom had to be super conscious even when they weren't about what voices they were putting into the public space because they controlled the public space. So nobody on the receiving end is limited by the narrow identitarian, you know, uh, contours of our show in any way whatsoever. If they want a bunch of fuddy duddies, you know, they can listen to me, you know, if they want something younger, if they want something, um, you know, different from what we are they can they can find it it's available i think the more vexed question is when we do a subject that involves um you know a a, a subject like a, a a show or a film created by a black creator right or on um you know or a trans creator or whatever no one no no one knows how to no one knows how to speak about the uh creativity no one or, it, or no one knows how to fully comfortably nor should they know how to fully comfortably speak about the creative output of someone who comes from um, a radically divergent and um, uh, viewpoint because you have to be you should be uncomfortable you should be trying to think through your own presumption right and at that point you're faced with a what I find to this day to be a really difficult choice do we 
colonially talk about this, uh, emit several howlers, um, reveal our biases and blind spots, or do we give in to what, what can feel like tokenism, right? It's like, oh, there's a, you know, there's, let's bring in a black guest to talk about Black Panther. I, mean, I don't think that that's an, that's not an easy choice really. And which is, which is the more demeaning, I think, has to be thought through on an ad hoc basis and the answer isn't that easy. The good news is we're so easy to cancel. <laughs> I mean, I, and I really mean that sincerely. I mean, you know, if you're if if someone is in a, in a digital environment, if you are offended by something, you can you can unsubscribe. But to us, in terms of an actual operational dilemma, that to me is is really the hard one. The fact that we exist, I can't do much about at this point. But the choices that we make within that, I think, are can not I ask June about the first point you made? The second point is a giant dilemma but a more obvious one. The first right. point you made, I believe, and tell me if I get this wrong, is that the heterodoxy of the distribution mode creates a general heterodoxy, or heads that way, which is to say the traditional three networks, you know, the monopolistic uh, from on high, this is your only choice. The only way they can diversify is to diversify in uh, possibly tokenistic ways. Right. What you're saying is that podcasting has this has always had this opportunity because of the strange labyrinthine ways in which it gets to people, and people have lots and lots of choices. And that doesn't get you off the hook, but it's a quality of podcasting mm -hmm. that enables you to say. Look, there's diversity in itself in being one of a hundred options you have, which are all free. And now 300,000, and just to, very quickly, because this is a question for June, but the barrier to entry is low. Exactly. That's the other thing. It yeah. really requires right. a microphone and, and an iPhone. And that is in itself right. a gesture toward uh, economic diversity, right? The, the ability of people to just put on a podcast means you don't have to be the only ones to create diverse voices, you, there's just a whole lot of options. Is that just an excuse, June, for not doing the second kind of diversifying? Is this legit? Uh, I mean, I do think those are two different questions. I mean, I, it does feel very important that there are so many options and that there, it's not just that there aren't the three networks and the public broadcasting and the big news, mm -hmm. it's that effectively we, you know, we all, we might choose different apps, but we just look at our phone and we just, you know, what, whether we're using Apple or Overcast or Pocketcast or whatever we're using, we can just search and we'll, you know, is anyone talking about this movie? Uh, is there a show about quilting? Is there right. a, and that, and that, sure, like if you're on a particular, you know, the, Apple does have an outsized influence and their player, because of the, you know, the fact that it for many people is podcasting or it, when, if you're on a Mac computer, that's what you will see. You'll see something. But and so they, they do have power. But actually, and people spend money. It's not it's I don't want to, you know, be mm -hmm. too um, whatever that word, Pollyanna ish about it. But th there there's there's more of a level playing field than in most parts of life and society. Um I think if the question is, is there a, a, requ a requirement for diversity, then yes, the answer is yes, there is. But I also think that there is something there is something a bit different for f about and for podcasting. I mean, there is there are many more. You know, the opportunities are endless. The you know, and also I, I listen to I you know I'm very interested in stationery. And there are lots of stationary podcasts, like lots, lots. I mean, like more than 10 that I listen to on a regular basis. And are one, you saying there are 10 stationary podca yes. podcasts so, but, about stationary? Yeah, but pens and pencils and paper. And, and one of them, the biggest, yes. But like they've made more than 300 episodes. And they have, oh they have you know, sponsors every week. They have two or three sponsors every week. Like... And you would just think, well, that's not possible. But if it is. It is because the possibilities are literally mm. endless. This is a revolution. This was a revolution. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, I mean, this I think, is yeah. a big, big thing. Yeah. And when you are walking around episodes. with your with your things in your ears, and you're, you, know, you can go from the BBC to NPR to Slate to, you know, a 
person in their basement to, uh, you know, uh, and there's it's all the same. It's all the same, and you don't need to pay a license, and you don't need to, like, you, you have to have a phone mm-hmm. but um, and some data. But oh, relatively speaking, it's, it's, it's very flat. However, mm. there's a new model, which is not three blokes and a microphone it's um you know much more highly produced narrative-based uh podcasting and um is it fair to say that slate might have lagged this just a tiny bit but then caught up very quickly with slow burn which was just a huge hit maybe talk a little bit about the genesis of that and like what it's like to get into this new business yeah i mean i think because we did have a hit with uh the chat shows and because we also then were able because um you know, partly we had good salespeople and also like the industry matured. People realized um, that how oh, people will listen, you know, that actually ads on podcasts are really effective because especially the kind that we do at Slate where like, you know, I'll be talking about, uh, you know, whatever the show is and then I'll say, and I'll go into an ad pretty much seamlessly. And it's clearly an ad. We're not, there's no deception going on, but, um, and I'm delivering this ad or you're, Maybe not you, but you know. <laughs> no. uh, so it, it's actually a very desirable ad product. Um, uh, and uh, what was I talking about? Um, uh, advertisers oh, yeah, figured so, out yeah, that yeah. the host so, read so we, is, is yeah. effective. So, so we were actually, you know, we were also doing quite well with those podcasts. And then, um, and I have to say that Slow Burn actually came through Slate Plus rather than through Slate Podcasts. So it that's our membership program and that's a different revenue source and they you know they were able to experiment because if we were late it's because Slate has always been cheap which is why we still uh, exist um, because those ty- kinds of podcasts cost a fortune because yeah. you need really smart people uh, working for a very long time you know it takes at least six months to make a show like Slow Burn with multiple people really working exclusively on that probably some people who are not there also working on sound design or mixing. Um, and it's, and then you have six or eight episodes mm-hmm. and it's just not that many opportunities to, to, to monetize in the way that, you know, 52 for your show. I know. Well, I was remiss also, I should say for those who do it. Does anyone listen to slow burn or has listened to slow burn? So I should have explained more what it was, but slow burn is essentially a, it was an incredibly gifted, I think of him as young Slate reporter, Leon Nafak, who was sort of on the crime beat uh, for Slate and came up with this idea of retelling the story of Watergate, which people would maybe be interested in and knew because of the analogy to the experiences we're all going through now with the Trump presidency. And additionally, as a generational story, I mean, someone like me can sort of recall dimly watching the Watergate hearings and somewhat lived through it as a pretty small kid. But there's a whole generation of, of listeners for whom Watergate is terra incognita or whatever the word is, like just totally unfamiliar and could be retold. And Leon's a natural storyteller. And you have tons of archival audio. Uh, he found a wonderful way in, which was what's her face being drugged Arthur. and kidnapped. <laughs> Just an incredible story. And he unearthed these wonderful, juicy, unexpected anecdotes and just retold the Watergate thing, a story uh, in season one and then retold the Monica Lewinsky um, uh, Clinton scandals in season two. Uh, and it was a massive hit. It was number one on iTunes and was must have been millions of downloads. You guys make some money on that? Because it was expensive to produce. Uh, yeah, over time, yeah. I mean, but also because it was done for Slate Plus, it's very. It was especially those first two seasons are very effective for, um, because, uh, in addition to the episodes that are free for everyone, there are also these extra episodes that give, you know, more information, bigger, uh, longer interviews, uh, different interviews, um, mm-hmm. and so uh, you know, people like to sign. I mean, people like to support Slate if they like Slate, but. You know, if you if you, you know that they're also, I'm going to get to hear this mm-hmm. thing, which sure. are the you know that I'm really interested in because this show has got me interested in this topic. Um, but I think this season's we have new host now and a uh, new production team. This uh, season is actually about the the sort of '90s rap uh, story, I guess, especially um, you know the deaths of Biggie and Tupac, and those episodes were all of the uh, ad inventory was sold before the season began, which was not always true for the other seasons. That's huge. And is that out? Yeah, we're halfway through. That's what I think. Okay. 
Can I ask you both a question? And then I think we should get some questions from our pals out there. Uh, and we have a portable mic we can get ready. We can warm it up. Um, so because of the success of podcasting and because it has, it turns out that there's a revenue stream, who knew, uh, jur the journalistic enterprise is tilted a little toward this. Um, do either of you lament that tipping toward, and you're both podcasters, you're also both journalists. Mm -hmm. I, I really like, um, I really like these very expensive, well, they don't have to be, but typically I think of them very expensive, very immersive, really big, you know, big lift uh, projects. Another one we should mention at Slate is a really amazing decoder ring made by our yes. TV critic, Willie Paskin, oh and, God, yeah. and producer Ben Frisch. Just amazing. And they've just done kind of on a monthly basis, which is incredibly astonishing, um, or extra astonishing. Um, but, um, and, you know, now, podcasts now are responsible for half of Slate's income, half of Slate's advertising income. Um, and it can't be a hobby anymore. It can't be like, you know, when I say hobby, that sounds a little demeaning. But, um, you know, essentially at the beginning, mm -hmm. people had other jobs and this was just like, I'm just going to take a few hours of my week and I'm going to do this because I really love it. Hobbies may be a little cruel, but it, it's no, effectively it was, it what was it was. A, it was a vanity project. Yeah, a vanity project. And, you know, great fun. Yeah. And it can't be that anymore. And I do, you know, I do feel a bit sad for that because you know, those were great. But it's very hard to launch a chat show now. There's just too many of them out there. There's, you know, the market's saturated, um, and th th that ship has sailed. Yeah. Um, and I and you were asking also about the relationship between audio and print, and then whether or not. My sense is that the odd thing about journalism is that it's harder and harder. It's it's. I mean, I don't want to be—I don't want to be glib about it. And I might be slightly wrong, but it's easier and easier to do it, and it's harder and harder to make money doing it. So, I think to the extent that you can learn, turn yourself into a Swiss Army knife, and and be able to. Now, the sad thing is, you know, the old days of being super antisocial, you know, the kind of classic writer who was never comes into the office, grinds it out, does their own thing, idiosyncratic and kind of half off the map, but comes into existence by being a writer and, and publishing. That person, I think, is going to struggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have mm -hmm. to be kind of comfortable in multiple formats, and whether that's a good thing, I doubt it. But yeah. the fact that you might be able to keep some version of print alive by these diverse revenue streams is huge, I think. And there are really, I'm not hard, but there are certain realities of podcasting um, so, for example, I remember right at the beginning uh, when we were making Day to Day, like telling Andy that we were closed on some day. We wouldn't be publishing that day. And he was like, oh, God, we have to do shows. And I was like, oh, radio. Oh, that's terrible. You have to keep, you know, because people turn on that radio every day. Um, you know, because at the beginning of Slay, we would take, you know, we famously were on vacation when Princess Diana died and, you know, didn't come back to say anything about it for a week or so. Um, we wouldn't days. be doing that these days. <laughs> but still, so. you know... It, if somebody goes on vacation and they are a podcaster, you have to find somebody to cover for them because you, ha you podcasts are on a schedule and like it is very professionalized and not that you know the rest of Slate isn't professional, but like if somebody goes on vacation, their column doesn't appear that week, probably. Um, mm. And so there, you know, there is I I don't quite know the significance of that, but there is a it's um, just kind of a, a harsh reality that, you know, it, it, they need to keep coming out. You Are you suggesting that podcasting has become more professionalized than mm, It's than more routinized, columns? maybe. More I don't routinized, know. More yeah. yeah. Um, let's take some questions from you people because your podcast listeners are very curious about what you think. Where's, the, where's that portable mic? We've got it. Who's got a question? <laughs> Hannah Lazar, you must have a question. What's, what <laughs> podcast do you listen to? Not many. We have to give her a mic, though. Um, I actually primarily watch YouTube videos and read articles. So I'm not an experience in podcasting, but I am very interested in how the Internet has sort of impacted media and how mm. it, journalism has sort of 
<clears throat> change to accommodate that. So do you have any more comments on how, like for instance, one of the things I found that you were talking about that was very interesting is that people are moving away from the traditional talk show where you're all professional and you have these one or two, three points that you just want to make. And then mm -hmm. people are becoming more interested in the more casual, personalized podcast <clears throat> format as a means of interacting with the world. So do you think that is somewhat connected at least to the internet and how the internet has sort of demolished a lot of the walls between celebrity and the average person? I mean, yeah, celebrity, but also I, I do think there's more voice in, in all media these days. I mean, if you look at the New York Times now, I mean, maybe just the editorial pages, but I actually expect the whole magazine compared to the New York Times 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, all media has changed in its it's less formal than it once was. Uh, and I don't know that we could say that podcasting is responsible for changing that voice because things like blogging, um, you know, so many factors have, have brought down those walls, including just the general, you know, decrease of formality in our culture. But, um, yeah, I, 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 and I mean, I also, is a f I don't know how long the ad market will last in podcasts, but the fact that it has exactly collapsed in online journalism, but you know, it has, you know, Google and, and Facebook have eaten, you know, the, the advertising lunch and they haven't yet gotten interested in podcasts. Um, but, you know, maybe that's definitely a factor that they haven't yet been able to take over in ways that they have the rest of the internet, including the media. I, I just add a couple things really quickly. One is that the pace of change is always interesting because when we started our show 12 years ago and political gap fest a little bit before that, oh, we were so informal and we were unrestrained by any of the typical, you know, formalities of broadcast journalism. And now I put on a podcast that's two people under the age of 30 or 35 or, you know, 25. And it's, I'm a dinosaur. I mean, I still, because I grew up with legacy media, it's just in kind of my voice and self-presentation, mm -hmm. even my informality by their standards <laughs> is starchy and absurd. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, the, the one thing to be Starchy a, and absurd. Yeah. That's you. Uh, that's that's, you that's you his band name. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. that's his band name. <laughs> the only other thing, <laughs> thing I would say is that I always think it's worth interrogating this kind of fake peer-to-peer mode of self-presentation, which is only getting more refined in the age of social media, and which tends to elide the question of who has a platform, why do they have the platform, you know, uh, to whose benefit are they speaking? Um, like, the, the question of authority is made to seem as though it disappears, which means that it's more important than it's ever been. How about the fake informality that's in yeah. some of the... Oh, oh, exactly. God, I can't stand it. Can I name one? Um, <laughs> the daily NPR political... Sure. Yeah. Oh, I can't stand the way they do that. Just give me the news. <laughs> right? Don't say, you know, ah, you have don't, a cold. Don't, don't, I mean, don't josh around. Yeah. yeah. yeah don't, don't josh around. I, I, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, it's you know, we can, over, we can overdo it, too. Like, our yakking at the beginning, like, maybe just cut that down. Just a little informality. We don't have to go all like, and then what did you do? And, you know. But with the with the Culture Gap Fest, the, the, uh, we know these three people so well that it would really, would be sad if they didn't, you know, do the usual, you know, yeah. dysfunction. We love that <laughs> dysfunctional relationship and we want a little of it every time, right? A little. We will never deprive you of dysfunction now. I can <laughs> promise you of that. Who else has got a question? We have time for a couple more. Briar, up front. Do we have a microphone? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it was really cool to hear you guys talk about like the emergence of podcasts and kind of being in the middle of something as it's emerging. I had a question about... Um, like paid podcast platforms. And I'm thinking of ones which are different from the sort of like subscriber benefits that you were talking about with Slate Plus, but um, like I became aware of this from, uh, I think it's called Anthem Hum Homunculus, which is the oh, John yeah. Cameron Mitchell. Mm -hmm. But, and that is again, like a much higher cost of production, but it's also on a platform where some of them are just sort of like talk shows. Yeah. But it's this paid platform, which seems to kind of, contradict what you were saying earlier about like access both for yeah. producer and consumer so I was curious to so the the main one of those these days is luminary which is yeah. where that is and it's also where our uh, former colleague Leon Nafak took uh, what was 
His his podcast is now called Fiasco, which is quite similar to. Uh, Did he jump ship? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, the thing is, that's basically a uh, what is that word? Uh, a VC, a VC, mm-hmm. <laughs> a VC. Yeah. A, a, um, I'm forgetting what VC stands for, but venture, yeah. Capital. Yeah. venture capital. Yeah, I mean, it's an attempt to disrupt this model that we are currently living in, um, and you know they gave people, they gave production houses large sums of money. They really, because they needed to get subscribers, they needed some big names. I It's too early to say how yeah. that's doing. I tend to think, and maybe it is just wishful thinking, that there's so much really good stuff that yeah. you can get for free, yeah. and there's nothing that spectacular about their play. I mean, you can, as well as their premium products you can also listen to any old po- you can listen to that mm-hmm. pen podcast on there too but um like there's nothing that great about it that you would yeah. want to so i it's people have failed before by saying oh nobody will <laughs> move away from this uh, you know i remember saying that about the newspaper why would anybody go online to find what time the movie's playing I know. <laughs> who goes to a movie anymore good god but um i just don't think that that's going to be a way um but you know, if you were in that first round, that's not a bad place no, to be. That's for sure. That's what I was hoping you'd say. <laughs> yeah. Let's. Uh, we have time for one more question. Somebody way in the back. Yes. Hi. Hi guys. So I'm a senior here, and I'm very interested in how different media outlets choose what they're gonna talk about, depending on whatever other push in the market they're having. So I was wondering in comparison to a traditional journalist in a 24-hour news cycle who by the idealistic version of what we think journalism should be needs to cover everything that's happening in the news, which they're failing because Twitter exists 24 hours now. (laughs) Um, So I was wondering how you guys choose to talk about how do you guys choose the contents of your own podcasts mm-hmm. in re- in relation and, co- and in contrast to that? Uh, so this so the waves is now the the, the feminism slash gender slash uh, podcast that I'm on. We're now only every two weeks, and so for us, it's kind of a question of you know what are the big stories, what are the things that haven't been completely you know, chewed over already. There's nothing new left to say. At the same time, sometimes something is so big that you have to be a little sort of egotistical and think, our listeners will expect us to talk about this because this is the big subject. And they're just waiting to hear what we say about it. Um, uh, And just, you know, the typical things of like some variety. So on the ways we want to, you know, and say it's ideal or we do it every week, but generally, speaking we'll have one culture topic one you know one outrage which is generally very easy to find and one um you know maybe something light or uh something will you know that won't be too too sort of depressing and then we always um have a question where we decide if something is sexist which shockingly it generally always is (laughs) um (laughs) No, yeah, shocking. <laughs> um, it was really shocking. Is when we decide something is not sexist. Um, so it's more. It's not really. Dis- I mean, in, in a sense, it's like what's what's news. What's the most important thing? What's what's f- also what's not been done elsewhere. Right. right. Um, sometimes we'll do the same thing as the a topic that the culture gapist might have done because we know that because of our focus, we'll be doing it differently from the way that they did. Um, but it's more, and also, honestly, a big thing that I think is often forgotten about is, will do we really have anything to say? And do we each have something different to say? Because, um, you know, especially because there are four of us, um, you know, if we're just going to all just repeat in our own varying and differing degrees of, of, uh, of smoothness, effectively express the same opinion, like, that's just not good audio so something that we'll disagree about too right also i would just add that a lot of things in the culture come pre-said you know it's the new marvel movie but the twist is x or the you know there's a kind of nothing just plops down from the entertainment 
media empire that created it onto your lap. It comes wrapped in a narrative created by publicists, created by compliant journalists, um, and created by the collective public imagination to some degree. Mm -hmm. And for us, I think it's always, can, can we go against that grain in some sense? You know, everyone is already saying this, this is the kind of hype, this is where the hype is, you know, this is where the, the narrative already exists surrounding this thing. Is there something original to say that unsettles that? I wonder if we could conclude with a question for each of you. Uh, it's a two-part question in each case, so there are going to be four things, right? <laughs> so uh, the well, you can you know you can be succinct. Um, <laughs> the uh, yeah okay, June first, the um, biggest fuck up, uh, screw up. Because the next one will be the most blissful moment, you know, where, and, and what's behind the second question about the greatest moment, you know, the great podcast moment that you've been part of is this assumption on my part, which I hope you will affirm or deny if it's wrong, <laughs> is that with the growth of the chat podcasts, and the informality of it, and the Andy Bowers idea that you know the conversation before the conversation is has come on a, a remarkable spontaneous articulateness in a lot of journalists, which I don't think they were ever challenged to do quite so much, and it is remarkable how how original, spontaneous, and surprising so much of the conversation is, and I think there's a great growth in that. It's been inspiring. So anyway, but first the f biggest fuck up. I, I don't. I don't. I hope I'm not just, you know, pretending not to pretending not to think of anything. But I would say my own personal thing. Um, I remember being on a podcast where we were talking about the election for the next um, mayor of New York after Mayor Bloomberg, Berg, and I was really sad because one of the candidates uh, was a lesbian, and it really pissed me off. Because always it happens that when it's the lesbians turn, they decide we're going to do something different. We're going to go in a different direction this mm. time. Mm. And I was really like, I was just so like, I was feeling really. And then afterward, maybe not right after the, we taped, realized, you know what? Maybe her position pro stop and frisk might yeah. have been another reason <laughs> that like it wasn't necessarily a bad thing that she didn't get elected. And I really just kind of. I, my, I was so, you know, I had blinders on. I, so you felt bad that you yeah. had taken that position. Did yeah. you get any flack? No, not in that case. And we, I mean, you will not be surprised to hear we do hear from people, um, both good and bad, but rarely is, I've rarely felt, I, I say, say and think many bad things, but like I rarely actually have felt, yes, you got me. You, I said something bad and you correct, like it's mostly people, people are nice about things where they should be mean and mean about things where they don't need to and be mean. what about an instance of horrible pushback in s social media to something that you said? No, I nope. mean, it you're happens too, all, it happens all the time, but it does. it's just silly. Yeah. And there's no worse one, worse no, one. Okay. No, no. All right, Steve, the biggest fuck up. Uh, I think the biggest fuck up in the history of our podcast was we did a, there, there, there are a few to choose from, Al, you might be shocked I've to heard discover. them all, you know. So, they do yeah. not end up on the cutting room floor, that's for sure. But I would say probably the biggest was we had, uh, there's a, so Slate used to be known for its contrarianism, right? The Slate pitch, right? Like, blue actually is not the color of the sky, you know, uh, whatever. And um, a very good journalist who probably doesn't really conform totally to that stereotype was Will Saladin, who was a very unpredictable, almost almost studiedly unpredictable, uh, unideological, unprogrammatic thinker and writer. And Will got onto the idea that GMOs were the climate change of the left, right? And my very strong feeling was this is not analogous at all. And in fact, there is some unsettled science. There is, you know, I, I really saw it completely differently. I thought, first of all, climate change is an existential threat and to be in denial about that is not the same thing as wondering whether or not genetically engineering food is ultimately good for the food system or the ecosystem. Which I 
tend to believe is still an open question. Will really doesn't believe that, and he came on the show, and part of the problem was I was in the midst of a nervous breakdown about my uncompleted book, and Will huh. came on and started talking about, you know, in just this kind of slightly, I mean, I, in, I mean this in the best sense, but he has this kind of mis- Mr. Spock, I am the soul of human rationality, and he glories in people being over over emotional in their thinking patterns and you got mad at him and i got so and what and that was one time where it ended up on the cutting room floor like there was a moment where dana stevens was like i'm really just asking you as a friend are you okay <laughs> right and i was like I, I just freaked out on him i really freaked out on him and what ended up on the tape was a lot of people wrote in and were like that's just not that's like being a bad host i mean like like hosts like you know, uh, someone who invites you over to their house and then, you know, yeah. yells at you, right? Yeah. Like, not even yeah. podcast hosts. Yeah. Just, so that was disaster. All right, before we turn to June for the blissful, greatest yes. moment, uh, well, I, I have one fuck-up for Steve. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's a fuck-up, but you and Jody Roden, Rosen talking about Dylan. Do you remember what happened? It was terrible. No, it's the sound. He like- really called you out. Okay. Do you want to play a clip? You want to? What? Uh, all right. You had. You know. You. You were. You were dismissing the later Dylan. And, I can't win. And he proved that you hadn't actually listened to a lot of the later Dylan. You don't need to listen to okay, it. Okay, that was a fuck up. I would say he was really mad at you. But you can't win if I say I don't like Taylor Swift. It's all because you worship Bob Dylan. It's like, I, you okay. know. All right. Anyway. Well, that's why it wasn't your choice. It was mine. June Thomas. June Thomas, blissful moment. I, because I'm an egomaniac, I love to be recognized by my voice. And I have gotten free beers from really? in bars from like from the wait stuff like you're on the you're on You mean you're at a bar coast. and somebody says, You're June Thomas, can yes. I buy you a drink? Or are they're the wait staff and they so they come the drink, which I suppose maybe is uh, bad practice journalistically, but come on, free drink. I only take one. Come on. Wow, so I, I like that. Like, what do you think of that? I like being Straps recognized. June getting drinks. And we have drinks in the back, and in a yeah. minute, a, pe- a lot of people can buy you drinks. <laughs> wow. I like being recognized more than bought drinks. I do. I was once, um, so I was in the, Hong- in the Hong Kong airport, and someone came up to me and said, are you June Thomas? And come on, that's like being a superstar. That's pretty cool. That's yeah, great. That's cool. Well, you had me at B-O-O-K. Book. Book. Yeah, right. It's like you know, the word is like said. Bits. I don't know why people find that amusing. What is B-O-O-T? Boot. So why is B-O-O-K not boot? Come on. Come on, people. Let's use some you logic here. You have a good here, point okay? there. Okay. I mean, yeah. But it's a, it's a signature thing. It is. Steve, blissful moment. Great moment. You mm. never felt better. I'm waiting to have one of those <laughs> now. But, um, well, okay. I think this is it. I So I... I used to do travel writing, or maybe still do a little bit, and twice, kind of semi-coincidentally, I've ended up in Tasmania. <laughs> and the way I describe Tasmania to people is, it's you know, it's a little island off the southeast coast, essentially, of Australia. It's part of Australia. It's traditionally the poorest part of Australia. And one reason it's that is it's a very wild landscape. But also, you know, you committed a heinous crime in England. They sent you to New South Wales, now known as Australia. You committed a secondary crime. Uh, in New South Wales, they sent you to Van Diemen's Land, now known as Tasmania. Uh, the Port Arthur penal con- colony there is is it was thought of as the most brutal um, uh, penal colony in all of the British Empire. If you committed a tertiary crime <laughs> in uh, in uh, in uh, Van Diemen's Land, they sent you to Norfolk Island. Norfolk Island is way out in the I guess South Pacific, and it's where the mutineers from the um, the Bounty ended up. Uh, after I think they went to the Pitcairns first, and then the, then a bunch of them went there. And so there are four um, surnames in the in the in Norfolk Island to this day uh, that are derived from the four main uh, ba- um, um, mutiny bountaineers that ended up there. And it's just a, wi- a wild, Edenic place, and I've never been. And on the show, I can't remember how this came up. I said, I said, I've always wanted to go there and I don't think I'm going to make it. But if someone, if I could just know that someone had downloaded our show and listened to it in the Norfolk and on Norfolk Island, and we got the most amazing email from this guy. He's like, 
I live in Sydney. I have never downloaded your show on Norfolk Island, but my partner uh, is from there and he's going to go there and I'm going to make sure that he takes, you know, we both <laughs> listen to the show and I'm going to make sure he takes his device with him and downloads your show in Norfolk Island. And it's that sense of just any, anywhere, mm, anytime beautiful. in the world it's possible to I communicate with someone. It's amazing. Stephen Metcalf, June Thomas, thank you so much, both of you. <laughs> What fun. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a really yummy snack reception and some wine and maybe even beer, but I think definitely wine. Please hang around. These two people are so nice. And you can hang around with them and talk to them. One more time. Let's thank them both. Thank you so much.